Okay, good evening, um, everyone. I'm the president of the Aquarium of Pacific. My name is Peter Kariva. And tonight we have a really special lecture by John Gertner. He's gonna be talking about ice at the end of the world. And I have to say, you know, here in California, we've been experiencing wildfires, sort of one extreme of a consequence that some of its causes are tied to climate change. While the other extreme is melting ice. Uh, there's nothing more visual and compelling than the image of melting ice for a warming world. And uh, John is a remarkable author. Prior to this, he wrote a book called The Idea Factory about Bell Labs. And I read it several years ago. It was one of my favorite books because it was about the playfulness that sort of underlaid the innovation that came out of Bell Labs. And I'm really excited to hear what he has to say about ice at the end of the world. John, take it away. Thank you, Peter. I appreciate being here. Um, I had very much hoped that I would be able to make it out to the West Coast, but the situation being as it is, I am here uh, in New Jersey uh, on the East Coast uh, as the um, pandemic continues. Um, but hopefully uh, uh, this will be a kind of um, second best thing. And, um, you know, I, I, I hope uh, very much to sort of take listeners and those people who are tuning in tonight uh, to this to, to at least give them a sort of slice of, of, of understanding about what Greenland's like, about why I wrote this book, about the science and the history of Greenland. But, um, you know, I, I think one thing I'd love to say, too, is that, you know, if it does pique your interest and someday when you do get the chance to, to not only read the book, but if you ever do get the chance to actually get to Greenland, it's a fantastic country, uh, one of the, I think, last natural and most beautiful places on Earth. And I'm not going to be able to capture that part of it tonight, but uh, what I do hope is that, that this will whet your appetite for, for what is just a remarkable, remarkable place that has, I think, really great importance over the next century. Um, I thought maybe as I jump in and talk about the history, or actually before I talk about the history and science of Greenland, I would be helpful if I could set the table a little bit by just talking about some facts and figures about Greenland. I think some of us know a lot about this country. Uh, most of us don't know much at all. Uh, you know, Greenland is, uh, as I will put here, um, the largest island in the world. That's if we don't include Australia, when we classify Australia as a continent. Um, its size is somewhat mind boggling. It's three times the size of Texas. It's five times the size of California. And amidst this absolutely enormous country, um, it only has a population of 56,000. It's one of the least popular, actually it is the least populous country in the world if we don't include Antarctica, which is technically not a country. Um, please don't confuse Greenland with Iceland, which is actually farther from the United States. Um, Iceland is actually kind of tropical compared to Greenland. And uh, most of Greenland is above the Arctic Circle. It's, um, which means uh, that during the winter, actually the sun does not rise and during the summer, the sun does not set. Of those 56,000 residents in Greenland, uh, the vast majority live along the coast, actually on the southwestern coast, along the edges. And uh, there are some small towns on the eastern coast. The eastern coast, the weather and the ice is much more formidable. Um, but of these towns, really, we're talking about tiny towns. Uh, settlements range in size from anywhere from 15 to 20 people to the largest town in Greenland, which is called Nuuk, N-U-U-K. It's the capital of Greenland, which has 16,000 people. And the last time I was in Nuuk, there was one blinking traffic light. Uh, this is, by our standards, really a small town rather than a big city. Um, uh, these are intimate places where everybody knows each other. Um, just a little more on the population. Of this 56,000, about 88% are of Inuit descent. And the Inuit, we believe, came over 800 or 900 years ago from northern Canada uh, over the sea ice that connected the continent to Greenland. Uh, you can see in Baffin Bay, they probably um, made a journey across the frozen ice towards the north of Greenland. Um, the Inuit uh, actually um, created a culture and I think and a, a staked out a livelihood in probably one of the most difficult and formidable climates of the world. Uh, I think 
what's interesting to talk about or to, to note here is that it wasn't that they survived um, in spite of the ice, but that they survived because of the ice. They created a culture around the ice of hunting and fishing on the ice, of transportation on the ice, of, um, of, of fishing for basically seal, narwhal, um, um, and of hunting for musk ox and for um, Arctic hares and reindeer. Um, since the early 1700s, I think the largest impact on Greenland has not, and on the Inuit culture has been the Danes. Um, Denmark colonized the island of Greenland beginning in the early 1700s. They brought missionaries there. After that period, they what began was a period of kind of economic, um, you could say exploitation, but uh, economic development that lasted several hundred years where Greenland was effectively a colony of Denmark. Uh, that ended in the 1970s. And since that time, Greenland has increasingly taken some steps towards independence. Uh, it's a, a self-ruling country with a government, a parliament, a president, but Denmark still makes um, significant contributions to its economy every year. Greenland makes money from fishing, uh, from halibut, um, from shrimp, uh, from tourism, but uh, Denmark still subsidizes it by several hundred million years, some several hundred million dollars per year. Now, there's this question, okay, well, why care about Greenland? Um, it's not because of the tourism industry. It's not necessarily because of the fishing industry. Um, Greenland increasingly has uh, sort of large mining interests, and I'll talk about the ice in a moment, but as uh, Greenland continues to melt, it's sort of made uh, some of these mining interests more accessible. Um, mining for nickel, for copper, for gold and rubies, also for rare earth metals that are incredibly valuable for electronics. Um, they're also, because Arctic sea ice is diminishing, especially in the northern areas of Greenland, uh, there's a belief that there's a great amount of oil up there, which I hope is never tapped. Um, as that would probably be the worst outcome of anything, but it has roused interest that there are oil reserves that are worth some money. Um, what we see is a renewed interest in Greenland geopolitically by countries like China, by Russia, and certainly it attracted the interest of the American government, as we recall, because Donald Trump, um, um, surprisingly enough, actually wanted to buy Greenland from Denmark last year um, in a kind of offer that surprised almost everybody, including Greenland and Denmark. So there's minerals, there's oil, there's fishing, there's culture, there's more than anything, there's ice. Um, Greenland is covered 80% in ice, 80% um, of the land. Uh, this is one of the last remaining ice sheets on Earth. The other ice sheet is in Antarctica, which is sometimes described as two ice sheets, East Antarctica and West Antarctica. Um, if you've ever flown over Greenland on your way to Europe, um, you know that the ice is almost beyond comprehension. Uh, while I was reporting this book, I spent several time, several days, entire days, really, with the NASA team flying over the ice all day long, surveying it. So ice covers about 80% of Greenland. Um, it, this is one of the last two remaining ice sheets in the world. Uh, the other is deep in the southern hemisphere in Antarctica. Um, these are remnants from an earlier time. In Greenland, the ice age hasn't really ended. And um, in Greenland, we're talking about a continuous stretch of ice that um, is kind of hard to fathom. If you've ever flown over Greenland on your way to Europe, you know the extent of this. Um, it's about 700 miles um, north and south, um, several hundred miles across of just a continuous stretch of ice. It's not an ice sheet per se, it's more like a dome of ice. And in the center of Greenland, there's actually a scientific camp right in the center of Greenland. Uh, the ice is so thick that it rises to an altitude of about 10,000 feet. So if you were to go from the top of the surface in the center of Greenland down to the bedrock, it would be two solid miles of ice. Um, the reason I think that this is, is, is worth talking about for a moment is that that because these are the last remaining ice sheets in the world, they sort of harken back to an ancient era um, that if, for instance, we were to go back in time 15,000 years, we would go back to the last ice age or the end, the ending period of the last ice age, and we would see vast areas of the world covered in similar ice sheets. For instance, here in New Jersey, um, or if I just went a couple hundred miles north of here, and we went back in time 15,000 years, I would be under about a mile of ice. Uh, 
And this was the great Laurentide ice sheet that covered northern Canada and parts of New England and came all the way down to New York City. And what happened about 12,000 years ago was that this great ice sheet actually melted from warming temperatures and shattered and poured into the sea. And geologists have, uh, and cl those who study ancient, clim ancient climates have a word for this, they call these meltwater pulses. That's why an ice sheet matters. It holds a lot of water. It holds a lot of water because it contains the remnants of snowfalls that have piled up over hundreds of thousands of years, or in the case of Antarctica, really over millions of years that have fallen, not melted, compacted, fallen more, and built up over time to these layers that, as I said, in Greenland is about two miles thick and in parts of Antarctica are even thicker. Um, if Greenland were to melt in total, you know, most of the world's coastal cities would be drowned. Um, and that doesn't even happen. That doesn't even include sort of what might happen with Antarctica. Now, this isn't going to happen next year. It's not going to happen by the year 2100. Um, but at this point, some of the ice loss from Greenland is happening and more of the ice loss is inevitable because we've already put enough carbon into the atmosphere to melt a good part of Greenland and probably a good part of West Antarctica. And here's something crucial, I think, to remember that ice sheets are lagging indicators. They take a while to respond to forces like warming oceans on their edges or warming temperatures, but they always do respond. And in the end, it may be the case that the response is pretty much unstoppable. Now, for about the last 20 years, Greenland's mass of ice has been declining steadily. And that means it loses more mass every summer than it gains in the winter from snowfalls. And it loses mass in two ways. It loses mass at the edges from these glaciers and massive icebergs that break off the edges. And it loses mass on the surface from warm air temperatures that melt and create, you've seen these pictures of these beautiful azure lakes and rivers that pour off of Greenland's ice sheet and into the sea. And in total now, the average loss for Greenland is about, it's just almost 300 billion tons per year. And that adds up to about one millimeter of sea level rise per year. And unfortunately, here's the really bad thing that we know that these losses seem to be accelerating. So eight years ago, this drew my attention. In the summer of 2012, Greenland had a very warm summer. And um, if you weren't following it, it was a minor news story. But for those who were sort of looking at the science, Greenland's ice melt went into overdrive, literally. And this caught my attention. Um, as a science journalist, I thought, wow, Greenland is, is melting, it's breaking. This ice sheet may be in its early stages of what glaciologists call collapse. And I thought this was an amazing story. Uh, no human population has ever really lived through an ice sheet collapse. And of course, I could see the terrible downsides here. There would be floods, there would be economic impacts, there would be property losses. Um, I think most of all, there would be a huge and awful impact on the world's poorest who are living on coastal areas and low-lying and uh, vulnerable areas. And I could see the problem really is that we built a civilization based on the idea of not only steady climates, but also steady sea levels, that they remain stable when in fact they don't, and when in fact from scientific studies, we know that they never have if we go back thousands of years. In fact, we know that every time oceans have gone up, ice sheets have gone down, and the same opposite holds. As ice sheets have built up over time, as the Earth's ice ages have come and gone, sea levels have gone down. Um, but I wondered, how fast will this happen? Um, you know, how fast does an ice sheet collapse? Do we even know? Will we have enough time to save our cities? What is the plan? What does it look like? How much can we know? And I began to look into Greenland to try and tell a kind of coherent story about the ice sheet, um, its past, its present, its future. And um, in many ways, I think this book began as a climate change book um, to sort of look at how one seemingly irrelevant part of the Earth, a part of the Earth we don't think about very much, which would be Greenland and its ice, um, may one day affect us in a very, very significant and very dramatic way. But as I began to read about the history of this place, I also began to see it as a story about how we discover things, um, how bit by bit over the course of the past century, and really the study of ice and glaciology is a very new field 
um, how bit by bit we came to learn and understand uh, what an ice sheet is, how it works, how it gains in mass or loses mass, how it's affected by temperatures, how it's affected by man. And I thought of this book as framed around three mysteries that were or are being solved by human actors. And the first question I, I wanted to answer was, how did we come to understand Greenland's ice sheet? You know, which people did that work? Because at, at the start, if we went back to the 1700s and the 18, early 1800s, we didn't really know what it was. This was an era before the um, age of aerial observation. Uh, we couldn't see inside. There were many questions. There were many mysteries. There were many myths about it, too, to explain what was there. Um, the second question came a little later. It was what secrets did the ice contain? Um, because as it would turn out, some very smart people dug into the ice sheet as they began to do scientific experiments. And they found that the ice sheet is a kind of almanac of time, that you could go back and you could find traces, for instance, of R the Roman Empire, how they used to burn uh, silver, and it would emit lead dust that would land on Greenland's ice sheet and would be contained at a certain point in time in the ice sheet. Or you could find remnants of volcanoes like Krakatoa that erupted, erupted hundreds of years ago, or even Vesuvius. But you could even find traces of leaded gasoline when it was burned into the atmosphere and when that stopped. And that there was something to be said about how to figure out how to use this ice sheet to sort of explain history in many ways. Third question, it regards the future. How will this ice sheet fall apart? Will it fall apart? What can we do to avert that fate? Um, what can we predict and what will be the implications and who was working on those questions? So those were the three, past, present, future, that animated me as I began to sort of look into that. And as you can see, I wasn't going to tell the story, the cultural story of the Inuit, which is a fascinating story, but the Inuit actually avoided the ice sheet. The ice sheet was not a place of sustenance. This was a hunting and fishing culture where the coastal areas were what was imperative to the Inuit. It was where the muskox were, it was where their narwhal um, hunts, where seal, where walrus were. Uh, staying away from the ice sheet was something that was important to the survival of their culture. So this other question was, who were these, who were the early people who sort of demystified the ice sheet? And it was mostly Europeans and Westerners, Scandinavians, um, Americans, the French. Um, and then the question to me was, okay, so when does this story start? When does the story of the ice sheet start? There are a couple ways of looking at it. For instance, um, as I said, the Inuit came to Greenland about 800 to 900 years ago from Northern Canada. But at around that same time, there was a colony of Scandinavians who came over from Iceland. These were known as the Greenland Norse. They were led by a warrior named Eric the Red. Uh, Eric the Red was the father of who we know as Leif Erikson. But Eric the Red was a very fine marketer, I imagine, because he enticed people from Iceland to actually come to a place he was calling Greenland, which was actually icier than Iceland. Uh, what we know about the Greenland Norse is that they settled on that southwestern coast where there were some very beautiful fjords and meadows. And um, we now believe that the culture there, the society, probably was about 2,500 to 3,000 people. And this was a formidable place to live. But between the years of about 985 to 1425, the Greenland Norse um, created a, a small society, thriving at times, and yet um, died out, disappeared. We don't know why. We have theories. Um, but in many ways, um, these questions about the Greenland Norse remain, and they are, as a kind of culture, society, an experiment in kind of creating an outpost in Greenland, they are a, effectively a dead end. So for me, the beginning is really actually with this man. Um, this is um, a Norwegian scientist, Fridtjof Nansen, an explorer, an oceanographer, a zoologist, um, and a humanitarian actually. Fridtjof Nansen later won the Nobel Prize for helping World War I refugees. Um, but in the 1880s, uh, he was working, actually doing experiments for his PhD thesis on a sealing ship that was hunting seals near Greenland. And he became captivated by the island that he could see off in the distance. And he came up with this idea that he was going to be the first person to ever cross the Greenland ice sheet. Um, he was going to ski across it. 
he was going to recruit a band of people, a band of several other men, and they were going to go up the eastern dome of the ice sheet and across and down to the western side. They would end up at a village, and then they would take a ship back to Norway. Um, he called this idea actually the scheme of a lunatic, and you can kind of see from Nansen. Nansen actually had a very light side too, but you can see from his his photo he was he was fairly intense. But um, he did what he had set out to do in 1888. He recruited a small group of people. His idea was that they would pull their sleds. They would pull them by rope. Um, they began on the East Coast uh, in a very kind of icy area after some delays. They spent really the entire month of September coming across Greenland, uh, 280 miles. He kept a wonderful, wonderful journal that I recommend by all means and um, made it to the West Coast. If I could just read a very brief passage actually of what it was like, because I think it's, it's almost hard to imagine pulling a sled for that distance through such awful temperatures. These were six men dragging five heavy sledges, each of the sledges laden with at least 200 pounds of gear, tents, sleeping bags, raincoats, skis, snowshoes, cameras, thermometers, barometers, canned food, dried food, tea, sugar, coffee, chocolate, matches, stoves, and fuel. All the sledges are pulled during the night when the August sun isn't melting the snow atop the ice sheet, transforming it into a soft white bog that makes the hauling even more difficult. Their skis remain packed up for later. They would be useless climbing up the steep gradient of the eastern slope anyway. Using boots fitted with sharp metal crampons, the men need to hike up, up through the crevasses to make their way to what they anticipate will be the smooth rising dome of the central ice sheet. The ropes for the sledges burn into their shoulders. The white glare from the snow and the ice, even at nighttime when the sun barely slips below the horizon, leaves them nearly snow blind. The frozen hills and valleys seem to ripple on without end. One of Nansen's team will later note that the terrain in these early days makes him feel hopeless, as if he's walking upon the waves of an interminable ocean of ice. Um, as I said, they, they did make it successfully. When they got to the west coast of Greenland, actually, they found that the last ship had sailed, the harbor was iced in, and they had to spend the winter in Greenland, which they did, actually. Nansen was thrilled about it. He learned how to kayak from the native Inuit. And um, they got back to, uh, to Norway and were greeted as heroes in the spring. Um, fortunately for me, I think, was that um, Nansen actually had a rival in this um, era, early era. Um, if Nansen was the sort of beginning of the modern era for studying Greenland and the Greenland ice sheet, um, the other person was this guy, Robert Peary, who we all know, I think, or many of us know, because his name is so associated with the North Pole. Uh, Peary famously claimed to be the first person to reach the North Pole. It's a point that remains disputed. Um, I tend to think he probably came close, but didn't do that. Um, but Peary, in his early career, actually wanted to be the first person to cross Greenland's ice sheet. Uh, when he found out that Nansen was the first person who had crossed the ice sheet, his wife told him the news and she said it seemed to her like he had just been told that somebody died. Well, um, Peary actually decided to do one better than Nansen. What he decided was that he would cross the Greenland ice sheet, but he would do it in a place that was actually in the northern part of Greenland. He would not just go across the southern part of the ice sheet, he would go to an unexplored area in the northeast. Uh, he would chart it, go where no one had ever gone before, and then come back. Um, a total expedition probably of 1,200 miles. Not only would he um, do this sort of epic uh, undertaking, but he would use or adopt Inuit methods. They would take dog teams that would pull them across. They would use furs. Uh, they would do a kind of, um, they, would, they would achieve things, at least as Peary saw it, that Nansen had not yet done. Um, I won't go into the details. Um, Peary's actually crossings of Greenland were, were some of the most miserable expeditions, I think, in the annals of exploration. Um, you know, this is the kind of thing, and he did this twice, the same route, actually, a couple of years apart, uh, where by the end, they're literally starving and eating shoe leather and frozen chunks of walrus, and then they start to eat the sled dogs that are pulling them, and it's just horrible beyond horrible. Um, in this desperate attempt to get home, and he does survive. But 
I think the point here is that Perry and, and Nansen form this duo. They don't really solve those early mysteries of the ice sheet, but they begin to show us what it is. Um, some of the early theorists believe that Greenland might have had like an oasis in its center, that the ice sheet was not a continuous mass of ice. In that era before airborne observation, nobody really knew what was inside it. And these men solved that question. They said, no, it is a continuous dome of ice. Um, they also showed that it could be crossed, that it could be charted. And their work actually aroused the interest of other scientists who would come along sometimes with Perry to look to do experiments. They brought botanists, they brought geologists, they brought geographers up there. And it aroused interest in this island and in understanding, I think, that um, maybe this place is somewhere you can cross, you can investigate, and that Greenland's ice does hold keys to how this former world, this world of ice ages, looked and behaved. Now, importantly, they also inspire a next generation of explorers and scientists. I mean, most importantly, um, there's this man, Nude Rasmussen. Uh, Rasmussen was born in Greenland and then spent most of his life growing up in Copenhagen. He still remains a kind of national hero in Denmark and in Greenland. Um, just an absolutely remarkable man, inspired especially by Nansen, who he later became friends with. Um, and we can think, I think, of Rasmussen as the last of the great Greenland explorers, um, but also someone who bridged this age of exploration and a later age of science that came after. Um, during his career as an explorer, he charts Greenland exhaustively, making crossings across the ice and all across Canada. He does an epic excursion uh, from one side of Canada to another on dog sled. He's known as one of the greatest dog sled drivers um, in all of Greenland. Um, and he also becomes an anthropologist of sorts, collecting stories as he tries to understand why different tribes of the Inuit can understand each other from Canada, from Eastern Greenland, from Western Greenland, and share a common language and common cultural attributes, um, how they are in fact a kind of diaspora um, with common ancestry. Um, in the sense of, of, of Rasmussen's importance, he also did something very crucial. He set up a trading station in northwestern Greenland, and this comes into play a little bit later, but he set up a place where local Inuit could trade fox pelts, and he would in turn um, sell them supplies that would avert these sort of terrible hungers that would actually afflict a lot of the natives uh, during cold seasons when the hunting was poor, the fishing was poor, the weather was terrible. Um, one thing I think is crucial is that when we look at Nansen, Perry, Rasmussen, this age of exploration, um, I'm tempted to say that um, the age of exploration was neatly followed by the age of science. But the thing is that history is a little bit messy, that it wasn't just explorers and then exploration stopped and then scientists came. There were overlaps. Um, Nansen, for instance, was a scientist who was taking all sorts of temperature and barometric pressure readings as he was doing his exploration. Um, Rasmussen, as I mentioned, was an anthropologist who brought along scientists on his excursions as well. But I think really what changed things was this man, Alfred Wegener. Um, Wegener was a German scientist. Um, in many ways, he's not considered an explorer. And yet in his early career, he went to Greenland for an actual entire year in 1906 as a young man and started to do experiments, um, mostly focused on meteorology. Uh, Wegener is mostly known for creating the theory of continental drift, the idea that all the continents were one day, one, you know, hundreds of millions of years ago, clustered together and then drifted apart. But really his main focus, or one of his major focuses during his entire life was Greenland. Uh, as I said, he spent a year there in 1906, uh, he returned there in 1913 and crossed Greenland's ice sheet with several other men in a brutal, brutal expedition where they almost died. In 1930, Alfred Wegener was a very established professor in Germany, and he decided that he would launch one more great experiment in Greenland. He would bring several dozen men to set up different stations around Greenland to chart its meteorology. The idea, he thought it was very important because the weather systems that eventually made their way over to Europe, passed over Greenland, were affected by the ice sheet, and he thought it would, it would be very revealing to try and gather more data and collect it. And the centerpiece of this experiment in 1930 was the idea that several men would winter over in the center of Greenland's ice sheet. 
in a station that they called Eismitte or Mid-Ice Station. Um, as I mentioned before, the center of Greenland's ice sheet is about 10,000 feet in altitude. Um, Wegener Station was at a place where it was about 9,840 feet. Um, I don't, again, want to go into all the details. There were tragedies. This was a very complicated um, expedition. Wegener succeeded in making his way temporarily to the Mid-Ice Station. But what was crucial is that three men, actually, uh, Johannes Georgi and another man named Prince Sorga, um, and, and yet another scientist, wintered over for four months, cut off from all communication in Mid-Ice Station in the winter of 1930. And they survived by digging a cave under the ice, covered over, and living down there away from the elements so that they could survive, with barely really enough food to make it through until they were rescued in the springtime. Um, what came out of this was plenty of meteorological readings, but I mentioned there was a man there named Ernst Sorga, and he was more of a glaciologist. And with plenty of time stranded in this ice cave, Sorga decided that he was going to dig into the ice sheet. And what he did was with a snow shovel, he dug a staircase into the ice, literally through the floor of this cave that they were living in, uh, 50 feet down, a very steep staircase. And he also took systematically brought blocks of this ice back up to the cave to make measurements. Mm -hmm. And he discerned a very regular pattern to the snowfall that you could actually kind of look at the striations on the walls. You could measure the changes in density in the ice as you went down. And you could get a very regular picture <clears throat> of how if you went down deep or as you went down deep, you were in effect going back in time. And what I think this idea of what secrets does the ice sheet contain, um, Sorga's work really starts the modern study of, of what, you know, part of what we call paleoclimatology. It's this notion that if you go down in the ice sheet and you take samples, you can find a record of weather and time and events that like a tree ring, the ice sheet has layers bit by bit and as you eventually go down, now Sorgo was bringing blocks up. What eventually happened was, and what eventually transpired was that scientists came up with the idea of just drilling hollow, hollow cores into the ice sheet and pulling up ice cores to do that work. But um, this notion that it's a repository of vital information that can be tapped. This was 1930. Um, I think this was a breakthrough of sorts, that this was something that should attract scientific attention. Um, what happened after was that there weren't hundreds of scientists who started descending on the center of Greenland's ice sheet. Uh, what happened actually was that World War II began and science in Greenland's ice sheet kind of stopped. Um, nothing really happens in terms of research. Um, and it really wasn't until about 1950 that we had um, a, a French team come back to the center of the ice, actually come back to the same place that Wegener's camp was situated about 20 years after Wegener's team had left to set up a winter station to do some similar work. Um, because of how Greenland's ice sheet works with layers of snowfall covering over everything year by year, Wegener's station was gone. It was under about 20 or 30 feet of ice at that point. But the French set up a station and for two winters, they did all sorts of meteorological readings. They took an ice core, they drilled into the ice and pulled up pieces of ice to take a look at these past climates and see what they could learn. They even dug a very, very narrow, deep hole, hundreds of feet down and men, Frenchmen, several French scientists rappelled down this hole to trace the layers of ice to sort of see if there was anything to be learned. What really, I think, set things into motion in a way beyond that French team was when the Americans arrived. Um, if, you, if we think about that era in the early 1950s, this was really the, the, the very beginnings of the Cold War. And amongst military strategists, the idea was that the most direct route from Moscow to Washington was over the top of the world, over the Arctic and through Greenland. Um, the Soviet Union was increasingly seen as a threat. The idea amongst American military strategists was that we should build a very large air base. And the site that was initially chosen or was finally chosen was actually the same site as Nude Rasmussen years before had set up that trading station. It was a place known as Thule, 
And it was a place that American ships really arrived at in 1952 to build what at that point was, I believe, the largest Air Force base in the world. Literally overnight, over the over a period of about nine months, they constructed a city in northwestern Greenland. It's actually still there today. I visited Thule Air Force Base. Um, it's smaller than it was in terms of the number of people there. But in its heyday, back in the early 1950s, there were 10,000 men and women stationed there. Um, it was literally um, a small city uh, with bars, with restaurants, with vast airplane hangars, uh, the idea being that they were there to defend um, America from a Soviet Arctic invasion. Um, what's interesting and what's important about Thule is that at that period of time, if the United States was going to fight a war in the Arctic, they needed to answer some questions about how that war would be fought. And there was a group of American scientists and engineers working within the Army Corps of Engineers. And they were trying to answer questions such as, how do you land a plane on ice, on an ice sheet, for instance? Or how do you build a building on ice? Because the heat from a building would melt into the ice sheet and it would become very destabilized. Um, these questions were harder than it, they, they might seem. Um, some of the other questions came later. Um, there were scientists involved with this effort who saw the American investment in the Arctic as a way that they could actually do basic science. They could piggyback on the resources of the American military and use it to do things like ice coring, to pull up pieces of ice from deep in the ice sheet and maybe find um, insights into paleoclimates, you know, climates from thousands and thousands of years ago. And one of the leaders of this group within the Army Corps of Engineers was a guy named Henry Bader, who was a glaciologist and um, scientist uh, based at Rutgers at the time, um, who had this idea that they, he very much wanted to drill an ice core from the surface of Greenland down to its bedrock. Well, the opportunity arose a few years later in the early 1960s. Near Thule Air Force Base, about 140 miles into the ice sheet, the American military decided that they were going to build an army camp, kind of an experiment known as Camp Century. Um, they built this under the ice, almost like Wegener's mid-ice station, but on a much, much larger scale. Uh, if you know how a kind of a subway, subway line is constructed, they make them with like a cut and cover approach. You cut a big trench, then you cover it over, and you put dirt on top. Well, building Camp Sentry, they brought massive plows, cut trenches into the ice sheet and snow, and then covered it over with corrugated metal, blew snow on top, and then successive snowfalls landed on top. And what eventually they created was these corridors, massive corridors under the ice sheet that were interlocking. They brought um, these, these sort of temporary housing into these corridors where the men would live, and it was all men. About 250 men were stationed under there. Um, there was a library at Camp Century. There was a bar at Camp Century. There were religious, um, uh, services under the ice there. Uh, it was a functioning military base. Now for that group at the Army Corps of Engineers, um, it was also a place where they could realize Henry Bader's dream of drilling an ice core from the surface down to the bedrock. Um, Camp Sentry isn't actually in the center of Greenland. The center of Greenland, remember, is about two miles from surface to bedrock. Um, it's on the northwestern area. It's probably about a mile from the surface down to the bedrock. But when you're in a base under the ice, what you do is you just kind of drill through the floor. Um, and what they did was they brought a drill. They, f they actually found a drill in a barn in Oklahoma and they flew it up to Greenland and they brought it down into Camp Century. This is actually what Camp Century looked like if you went under the ice. This was under 25, 30 feet of ice. Um, and they set up this, this drilling derrick under the ice. And beginning in 1963, every summer, they operated this drill to bring up an ice core from the ice sheet. Now, of course, you don't bring up one continuous core. You bring it up in increments. So you might bring up three feet or six feet at a time. Um, it was a slow process. And on July 4th, 1966, actually, the engineers working on this drill uh, finally reached the bedrock of Greenland. So what they had was thousands of feet of ice cores um, marked with these snowfalls that had compacted over thousands of years and they had the record of these all put into cardboard tubes. Now 
getting an ice core out of Greenland's ice sheet was really difficult. This was the first continuous ice core of its kind anywhere. But you actually had to figure out what it said. What were the clues inside of it? What was, was there any meaning to the ice? I mean, it was understood that this was a record of snowfalls over time. But it actually took a group of scientists several years. Uh, one of the most notable in this group was a Danish scientist named Billy Donsgaard. And using tools of mass spectroscopy and other, um, other tools in the laboratory, um, they came up with a way where they could date portions of the ice core and figure out what the temperature was like on the surface of Greenland during that year. And in 1969, this group of scientists using the Camp Century Ice Core published a cover story in the magazine Science. Um, it was called 1000 Centuries of Climate from the Greenland Ice Core. And it traced the temperature of Greenland and of the Northern Hemisphere over the course of 100,000 years from this ice core. Um, this was a, actually a remarkable paper. I think it might be one of the more important papers of the 20th century. It showed how temperatures went up and down in dramatic fashion. Um, some years later, scientists using ice cores would actually capture tiny bubbles that were encapsulated within the ice that were records of ancient atmospheres from tens of thousands of years before. But what was interesting, I think in particular, what stood out from this original paper in 1969, this original study of the ice cores, was that about 12,000 years ago, back actually when those massive ice sheets covered the Northern Hemisphere, I talked about those Laurentide ice sheets that shattered and melted into the ocean in these meltwater pulses, um, that temperatures didn't just go up kind of in a gradual way. I think the notion is that in a warming world, temperatures sort of increase incrementally or steadily. But what this ice core showed was that the climate flipped to almost an entirely different state. Um, in later years, uh, glaciologists and scientists would come up with a name for this. They called it abrupt climate change. Um, but I think you know that ice core and later in later years, scientists would go back to Greenland repeatedly saying, did this really happen? and taking ice cores from another project, for instance. Uh, these are ice cores from the Greenland Ice Sheet Project 2, uh, taken from the dead center of Greenland, uh, two-mile ice core in the 1990s. Looking at that period of time from 11,000, 12,000 years ago um, to understand what had happened, that maybe climate doesn't just necessarily go up incrementally, but it goes up dramatically sometimes to another state. Um, the, the ice cores from Camp Century like the ice cores from the Greenland Ice Sheet Project 2 in the 90s, like other different ice core projects over the years, are actually kept in a library. Um, I went there during the course of my book. There's a, it's a place called the National Ice Core Library. Uh, lab. It's out, outside of Denver. Uh, they have tens of thousands of ice cores there going back to the 60s. Um, if you go there, actually, it's, it's kept at minus 40 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Um, pens don't work, so you bring a pencil. Uh, if you bring your cell phone, the battery immediately discharges as it freezes. Um, but I had the good fortune to be with a scientist who brought out an ice core from that moment in time, right when that climate change, that abrupt climate change occurred. And she put it on a nice table, on, on a light table, excuse me. This is not the actual ice core, unfortunately, in this photograph, but it gives you a sense of how those bands sort of function. And we looked at this ice core when this temperature shift happened. And she said, you know, if you look on the left and you can see these narrow bands, that was the ice age. And if we look on the right side, that was the end of the ice age. And what was crucial is that this one core of ice showed us that it was within a, a sense of about 10 years time, a decade's time, the temperature went up 10 degrees Fahrenheit. And again, I think that was a sobering moment, uh, not only for science, but but for me, watching that, seeing that ice core personally, again, that idea that temperatures will go up gradually and slowly, we can see, we know from the ice cores in Greenland, we have learned that it, that isn't necessarily the case. Our climate is more unpredictable than we think. And history tells us that there have been surprises and that there may be surprises again. So I think this takes us to that third great question of the ice sheet. If the first was, you know, what is this, this um, place? How do we explore it? How do we chart it? What's its geography? And if the second is about unlocking these historical scientific secrets in ice cores, uh, 
Um, that third one is, you know, how does it collapse? What happens now? And this is a different question, I think, because it involves a lot of science about climate models. And this is scientists who go, you know, work at their computers, but also scientists who go out into the field and make um, very, very complex and um, sometimes tedious um, data collection from the ice sheet in very difficult circumstances. And it also comes from satellite observations that are constantly scrutinizing the ice sheets, both in Greenland and Antarctica, and collecting data so that we understand how these ice sheets, ice sheets are changing in real time. Um, what we know now is that, as I said, Greenland is losing a, close to 300 billion tons of ice per year, probably somewhere in the, in the realm of 270 or 280 billion tons of ice. And about half of Greenland's ice loss comes from glaciers like this. Now, these glaciers in Greenland are vast rivers of ice that flow off from the central ice sheet. Um, they're incredible to be there. I camped at a glacier much like Helheim Glacier, but I camped on the west coast near Jakobshavn Glacier. Um, they're, they're absolutely amazing how they bring massive quantities of ice from the ice sheet and shuttle it out to the coast and break off into these actual stupendous icebergs that in turn float away, melt, and raise sea levels. So that's about half of Greenland's ice loss, half of that 280 billion tons on an average year. Um, the other half comes from surface melting, um, this melt water that these azure lakes, again, these rivers that pool um, and, and, and pour off the sides of Greenland as warmer temperatures um, flick the ice sheet um, increasingly um, as in that summer of 2012 when a warm pressure system uh, hovers over the ice sheet and the melt is just incredible. Um, what I think is, is crucial when we look towards the future of Greenland's ice sheet is that not only is Greenland's, are some of Greenland's glaciers accelerating and breaking up and collapsing, not only is the melt increasing during certain summers, but there are certain feedback loops that accelerate the melt. For instance, as I mentioned, Greenland's ice sheet is fairly high in altitude, but as it melts, especially on the Western sides, um, that altitude or that, that elevation declines. And at lower elevations, the temperatures are warmer. Um, the lower, the more, as Greenland melts, it gets lower in elevation. At lower elevations, it's warmer, it melts more. Uh, a similar, I think, feedback loop happens with the darkening of Greenland. For instance, um, as the snow cover uh, sometimes is, is melted, uh, old ice is revealed, which is actually darker than the, than the snow cover. It absorbs more solar energy and melts. Uh, there's also these blooms of algae and, and microbes on the western side of Greenland uh, during warmer weather, which also darken the surface of the Greenland ice sheet. Again, darken it, absorb more solar energy, and hasten the melting. I think we're in a situation where um, the more Greenland melts, uh, the more Greenland melts. And it's become clear, I think, to me that the decisions we make as a global society about putting increasing amounts of, of CO2 into the air, well, you know, not only do they affect this ice sheet, but that this ice sheet may hit a point of no return to where these feedback loops kick in and the ice melt is unstoppable. Again, it's not something that will happen overnight, but it is something where it might reach a point where that um, the elevation is too low, the darkness of the ice sheet is too significant, um, and those cycles of melt um, kind of reinforce each other to where it gets um, to a point where it cannot be halted. Um, I think um, at the rate we're going, we're, we're, we're in a very serious moment with Greenland where we probably don't have many years to sort of change the way things go. Um, last season, <clears throat> actually last summer in 2019, or not this past summer, but the one before, was a lot like 2012, which when I first became interested in Greenland, um, we know from satellite measurements that Greenland lost 532 billion tons of ice that summer, um, enough to cover California in four feet of water. Uh, this famous picture of sled dogs went around the world. They're kind of on, on sea ice covered in that kind of blue meltwater um, and sort of captured everybody's attention, but only for a moment. But um, I think what we, we can see here is that the situation is, is not only um, 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 remarkable, but uh, um, going in the, very much the wrong direction. I just want to um, conclude with this 
with a short description of, of what it's like to go there during meltwater season, what I call meltwater season. Summer is a time when all the scientists, glaciologists, hydrologists, um, oceanographers converge on Greenland. It's a kind of natural laboratory to study Greenland, to study climate change, to study the place where the world is warming faster than anywhere else, which is the Arctic. And um, again, you know, the, the stakes, I think, are supremely high. Um, we can think about how all this melt will drown the great cities of the world if we don't halt it. But um, to just give a sense of, of what it's like to be there in those summers with the scientists, let me just read a short passage, and then hopefully uh, Peter and I can talk a little bit and have some comment back and forth on some questions. There were so many arriving for meltwater season Scientists mustering supplies to camp on the ice sheet and water and measure water pooling along its surface or to gauge streams rushing, rushing into Mulans, the deep holes in the ice sheet that bring water into secret plumbing channels thousands of feet below. In Greenland's local cafes, you could meet glaciologists, hydrologists, anthropologists, geomorphologists, and sedimentologists. Greenland was like Los Alamos in the 1940s. The small city in New Mexico that served briefly during World War II is the nexus for all subatomic knowledge, except here it was all about the science and the impacts of ice. You might chat with marine biologists studying the survival habits of narwhals and polar bears in a changing habitat. Or you might discuss ancient history with archeologists who happened to be digging into the remains of the Norse ruins in the Southwest. The latter were racing to finish their work before the permafrost that preserved those remains melted and the artifacts deteriorated. If and when that happened, the historical clues to the Norse disappearance in the 1400s might vanish forever. All of these research projects conducted between 2014 and 2018 happened to coincide with the hottest years ever recorded on Earth. But in Greenland, the rise in temperatures was even more acute than rising global averages implied. Much as climate models had predicted, the Arctic regions appeared to be warming at twice the rate of the rest of the world. In June 2016, a visitor could relax outside in a t-shirt and shorts in New Greenland, cap Greenland's capital city, where it was warmer at 75 degrees Fahrenheit than in New York City. The winters in Greenland were becoming more temperate too. At the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administ Administration, Scientists summed up their annual observations for 2017 by noting that the Arctic environmental system had reached a new normal. The region now appeared to be in a permanent state of decline with thinner snow cover, steady reductions in the mass of ice in the Greenland ice sheet, and dramatic losses of sea ice in the Arctic Ocean. In fact, over the past three decades, the sea ice cover had been reduced in area by about half and less ice in turn meant that darker and more open ocean waters could absorb more sunlight. That change would melt the ice even more and thus bring even more heat into the region. It was a painful feedback loop and it seemed that no place in the North would be immune to the seeping warmth. In February, 2018, at Cape Morris Jessup, a weather station at the Northern tip of Greenland, instruments registered daily temperatures 45 degrees Fahrenheit above normal. Seeing as the station was only 400 miles from the North Pole and was shrouded in the constant dark of Arctic winter, the news left many of the world's meteorologists dumbstruck. The Arctic is the world's cooling system, a Finnish official, Stefan Lindstrom, remarked not long after. If we lose the Arctic, we lose the world. Okay, John, that was um, terrific. You are a wonderful raconteur and <laughs> And like your 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 Bell Labs book, you have a knack of of you know putting personalities into these stories with the science and all the things that's changing, which is really good. Uh, you know, I wish I could sit and 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 spend like a couple hours in the living room talking to you about this, but I got I'll try to control myself and ask questions I think an audience would like to ask. But first, I gotta ask some questions that um, just appeal to me. Sure. You know, you talk about. Um, I always wonder when you when you when you hear these stories about people, right? By Robert Perry and Nansen, like what was their personal life like? You alluded to, you know, Perry's wife and did Nansen have a family and kids? I mean, these were men who just went off and did maniacal things almost. And so, what what, what was it like back home? Yeah, they they did indeed. Um, 
very different. I mean, Nansen was was unmarried when he did this. He was a much younger man than Peary when he crossed the Greenland ice sheet. Um, in later years, I mean, Nansen actually did this extraordinary um, um, epic uh, excursion to try and reach the North Pole by having his his uh, ship frozen in ice and brought up to the North Pole through the gyre of of ice, um, in in a journey that took several years. Um, I think. Th- they were away from home for years, literally. Mm-hmm. Um, Nansen was married later, a little later than Peary was. Peary would leave his life, his wife, for several years. Uh, Peary had a, a mistress in Greenland, an Inuit woman. Woman, actually, Peary fathered um, either one or two children. I believe he fathered two children in in Greenland uh, that his wife ultimately found out about um, and was not at all pleased by that. Um, Peary uh, was a, I would say, a dark character. Peary is 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 a, um, I think, mysterious. I'm not sure. Um, even biographers have sort of been, I think, and I was too, uh, to some extent, flummoxed by Peary. Um, we don't understand in some ways why he did what he did, um, put himself in great danger, um, literally just awful physical misery, where he lost many of his toes, uh, was in kind of constant pain. Um, so I would have to say his physical life, his actual life was not necessarily a good one, but he was driven by a kind of desire to be the first. He was desire for fame, not necessarily money, um, a kind of insatiable, um, um, you know, want of celebrity. Um, Nansen, uh, uh, I, I would say, um, is a much more appealing character. He's a much more intellectual character. I mean, he's a much more um, intelligent person, I think, in some ways. Um, not only a great writer, but a good scientist and, a, and, a, and a, um, uh, actually a, a fairly decent artist. He, his diaries and his books about the Arctic, both about crossing Greenland and that later trip I described about having his ship caught in the ice, um, the sea ice, uh, a book called Farthest North, that's just a classic of Arctic literature, and um, they're really beautifully written. Um, so very different people, very different lives. Um, I don't believe they ever met. I looked for proof that they ever did. They corresponded, um, and they lived at the same time, but they never actually sat in the same room talking to each other. Yeah, and, and one more thing before we get to the questions that I think most of the audience will want to hear is the whole theme of, you know, exploration. You know, the, the great explorers and the great explorers really being intermingled with science along yeah. the way. It's one of my favorites. I'm, I'm a conservation biologist mm-hmm. and Lewis and Clark's journey and the, and the journal they took as they crossed North America and what they recorded. And, um, it's, I mean, it's actually data from these things that happened hundreds of years ago that are still yeah. in, incredibly valuable data. Uh, you, you know, I wish that they were that more people took advantage of it. You know, more people used it and recognized how much was recorded by these early explorers. It is not just adventure; it is it is science. Right. right. Um, your your books do that. That you know, do you ever think about you know, just the world in general? Ought to when you, when people take science classes, they don't learn this. When you take science classes, like in high school, you don't learn this. I think this would be a great way to learn science because it's much more exciting. Yeah, I, I mean, your your point is a great one, and and uh, and to be honest, I, I probably was a bit naive coming into my own research on this. Uh, and and um, the point is is very similar to what you said about Lewis and Clark. I mean, some of those measurements taken by Nansen in the center of the ice sheet. I mean, and even. Uh, later, these early photographs or even early paintings of glaciers are data points that we can use to say how much has the glacier receded since this photograph was taken 100 years ago or since this description was made at this certain point in time. And it's become very valuable uh, to sort of use this contrast uh, of, of, of what they did not have were the sophisticated tools, obviously, that we have today. But um, they were earnest, they were meticulous. Oftentimes, they were steadfast in collecting that data. And um, I think, yeah, it's, a, it's certainly a, a great way to sort of um, understand um, how those kinds of, I think, platforms or those early kinds of first scientific forays began in this, I, I wouldn't even call it a pre-scientific era. I would call it that kind of, um, it, because they didn't necessarily 
see themselves as as uh, only explorers. They saw themselves as doing science as well, right. at least with the tools that they could. And, and the last thing before turning to the future, did the Inuit communities in Greenland um, have a strong sense of climate change and what's happening there? Um, they do now, for sure. Um, yeah, and I had many conversations when I was up there about that. Um, it, it's, um, you know, I, there's, there's, I can't say there, there's one takeaway from that. Um, I talked with, hunt, you know, fishermen who were actually pleased that the harbors weren't iced in all winter, uh, where they could actually make a living. Um, it has uh, economic benefits in that it allows for the country to sort of for certain things like fishing and tourism to be more viable. Um, so for some Greenlanders, there's actually an upside to a warming world. Um, there's also a sense of grief, I know I noted, amongst some hunters especially, um, or people who were, you know, sled drivers and sled dogs, um, that that is not just a cultural change as younger generations are sort of moving to bigger towns or even moving to Europe, to Copenhagen, but that these old ways of life of, of actually um, safely um, running, uh, uh, sledding along the sort of what they call the ice foot at the edge of the continent um, is something you can barely do anymore because of the climate. So there's a, a deep sense, um, I would say, um, a sense of opportunity among some people, but definitely a sense of loss amongst others as well. Yeah, and, and now sort of turning to the to the future and some of the ideas you brought forth there, you know, one of them was this notion of the positive feedback loop, the positive feedback loop in the ice melting. And, and uh, as I'm sure you know, there's positive feedback loops all over the world in, in a climate system. And that's what has everyone so worried. And, you know, as things go bad, it only makes them go bad faster. Yeah. Somehow I don't think that that narrative, that recognition has gotten into the sort of common um, discourse about climate change. Yeah. You know, the, the, I mean, people know it's a climate crisis. They know that the longer we put it off dealing with it, the, the more they cost. But I have not seen much coverage of this positive feedback and what it means. How, how do we get that story out there? Because that's actually the biggest story. Yeah, and no, I, I agree. It's a, um, sometimes I tend to say that you have to understand, um, this probably isn't the best science communication because it's a little complex, but that, that there's an asymmetry to ice sheets, that they take hundreds of thousands or even millions of years to form, but they can actually melt and break apart in a relatively quick amount of time. But um, I mean, for me, I, I, when I try to tell the story of Greenland, I try to tell the story that of that point of no return, that after a certain moment, you can't just build an ice sheet back. Um, much like, say, an endangered species or a population yeah. that's threatened, that you reach a point where you can't undo what has been done. And I don't know, um, believe me, I, I, um, I'm just a writer and I'm, I'm just a journalist and historian, but, but to, to sort of, and, and I, I find, um, I do find that that message uh, resonates. Um, I, I guess, like, as you know, trying to get it to resonate with people who can make a difference through policy um, um, in ways that are, that are, that are hugely important that pay dividends, whether it's not just to Greenland's ice sheet and not just to sort of changing our energy systems to cleaner energy and less CO2 emissions, but also to sort of preserve our oceans and a coral reefs, which is terrifying to me too, if we lose those coral reefs and lose that kind of like base of the food chain, um, all those things, um, worry me tremendously. Um, so I, I, do, I, don't know, I don't know the key, except I, I do know that that notion of points of no return, that notion that we may go too far and that we're very close to the edge, especially with a place like Greenland, is, um, is certainly what got me to do the book. It's, got, it's what drove me to sort of try and sort of raise the alarm. Yeah, I think it works better with words and narratives, frankly, than I, I, t I teach sometimes at high schools and mm. places like that. And, Modern teaching is much more in little tidbits, mm -hmm. broken up into little tidbits. And um, I don't think it lends itself to a little 
blurb or tidbit. I, th- I think it 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 needs a story to be able to get it across, and I just haven't seen it done that well right. in education. The other thing that fascinated me, and it, and it really created image. I, so I take it you spent time with the scientists during the summer. How, how much? How, how much time were you there with them? And, um, I went to Greenland um, six times over four summers, five summers. Maybe, maybe I went there seven times. I should check my, <laughs> my notes. Um, sometimes I went for conferences and to shadow scientists in the field. Um, I camped for a week by a, a glacier, one of the largest glaciers in Greenland called Jakobshavn, um, with a scientist named David Holland from NYU, who's doing some terrific work, uh, both in Greenland as well as in Antarctica. Um, I went to the center of the ice sheet a couple times too. I, I flew to Summit Station, uh, which is in the center of the ice sheet, not too far from where Wegner's camp was, um, mm-hmm. where they pulled out some of these essential ice cores. I also flew to another point in the center of the ice sheet one day, and you get on these sort of large military planes that land on the ice sheet with skis, um, where uh, a Danish team was pulling up a large ice core um, over the course of a couple summers. So, um, yeah, I got to see the science firsthand. Um, it was, um, fantastic. I mean, what a, what a, a once in a lifetime experience to just sort of meet some of these people who are dedicated, who are obviously not doing it, uh, for the money, but for the love of science and to, to find information. Um, these ice cores are still telling us new information. Um, they're trying to help us understand how the ice sheet um, behaved in ancient times and how it might behave in the future, whether it gives us clues. Um, you know, there's, um, as, as you might imagine, um, sometimes with science, there, there are different, um, I guess, silos or different groups of scientists and you try and get them to all talk to each other. So, you know, there, there are the ice core group, the ice core people, and then there's, there's scientists who, who focus on the glaciers. And then there are scientists who focus on the hydrology of Greenland and who focus on warming waters and how those are changing the Greenland. Um, and I, I spent time with uh, as many of those groups as I could, including the meteorological groups that are looking at warm weather patterns over Greenland. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I'm probably like taking us far afield, but, uh, but for me, um, I can I can say one, one of the great experiences of my life was to spend time with the scientists in Greenland, um, and just get an idea of, of their commitment and the kind of work that they were doing. And, um, you know, it's, it's amazing, um, to come back to the U S and sort of see where our focus is. And, and, you know, these people were heroic to me really. Yeah. Um, and, and, and looking not only, um, just at what's going on now, but also historically, even, you know, in, in the eighties and the nineties and, and the two thousands, um, the scientists who did the early ice cores, who, who did these first studies on climate models, um, and also the scientists and engineers who built these incredible satellites that, um, have given us a picture of earth that we never had before. And in particular for the ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica have proven really incredibly valuable because they let us monitor things in a way we never could before. Yeah. I mean, we, we have a better understanding of the planet because of the satellites and the things you're talking about than we ever had by order of magnitude. It's phenomenal. But so I'm wondering, you know, one of the neat, and you alluded to the Los Alamos thing, when, when you get these scientists together, I don't, I don't want to sort of prejudice your answer, but I got to believe because I hear it when I get together with my science colleagues, there's a kind of a gloom about climate change. Yeah. You know, it, you know, we have all these people working on it, better understanding it, better understanding the consequences. But, you know, late in the night when you're maybe drinking scotch or beer and you spent the whole day working, um, so often when I get together with my colleagues, this gloom takes over the conversation did you see that there because that's sort of the source of the gloomiest data <laughs> yeah i i did i mean i saw it a, a little bit I, I i might i i i can't you know this is anecdotal it's not um it's not um a, a, a scientific survey on my part um i think i noticed that when the scientists were in the field there was a kind of purposefulness to their work right. and and i think it was an enthusiasm that um, right. You know, you want to make somebody, you want to make a scientist or glaciologist happy, happy drop them in the middle of Greenland, and it's it's wonderful. Yeah, you know, it's it's yeah. wonderland, and and it's the culmination of of all they've studied. You know, all those years of work, and they kind of finally get to do that. 
Um, but yes, yes. I mean, I've had those late night conversations with um, scientists working on this. Um, a lot of them have, I think, worked through a certain measure of grief um, for the planet. Yeah. And I think um, have tried to come to terms with, um, with, with the fact that their work is valuable. It's important that we will have to come to terms with action. Um, everybody, myself included, wishes that action had come sooner rather than later. But, you know, Eric Regnault, who's a very, very highly esteemed glaciologist, he's at University of California, Irvine. Um, um, he said something to me once. He's like, you know, we already have a lot of the sea level rise baked in. You know, we can't avoid it. But, you know, he said, you know, we're, we're tough. And when we have our back to the wall, we do act. Um, he does wish we acted earlier. He's keenly aware, perhaps as much as any scientist I've met, that there are these feedback loops that might trap us in some very dire circumstances. But um, some of the scientists do have hope, I think, that, that we will act. Um, you know, again, anecdotal, I'm sure you can ask 100 scientists and get 1,000 opinions. But, but yes, I, I, I've definitely had that experience of, of, yeah. of some gloominess. Yeah, I, I'm, I personally am one of those optimists, too, that when we have our back to the wall, we act. But I also recognize that this is different than previous crises where we had our back to the wall. It's yeah. it's a little more complicated and requires a little more collaboration, I guess I would say, <laughs> at yeah. a global scale. And that's that's yeah. you know kind of different. Mm-hmm. You know, I sort of when I, when I end up, I um, so you have your the the Bell Labs book that is really a story of science and innovation and discovery and a culture that surrounded it and all the things that came out of Bell Labs that we take for granted that really have improved our lives. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I haven't read this, but now I'm, you know, now I'm going to, but I, but just from your story, you, you know, you have the same discovery and excitement of discovery, but you're not, yet at the solution, you know, to make the better lives yet. It's the discovery that tells us we need to do something. Yeah. Um, what do you think, you know, what, what, do you, what do you think the role of science will be, you know, in making this transition to the better world? Is it, but what do we need? What do we need to do? Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a, it, you're, I mean, you're spot on that, that observation. I, I think, I think with Bell Labs, um, it was like, how do we create technology, new things? And what, what do they do? How do they change the world? And um, Greenland book was a little different. I mean, it's, it's also about, it's, it's less about, I guess, innovation, which is a little bit different than discovery, but I think it's this sort of notion of, okay, well, what do we do with new knowledge? Because we're not going to make products out of it. We're not going to make our lives better. We're not going to, it's not a matter of new dishwashers or new um, uh, electronic gadgets. It's knowledge to make, I think, better policy. Um, I mean, I remain a little bit optimistic. I mean, I, I guess without being sort of a techno utopian, I, I, I do, I am um, heartened a little bit by the idea that we have um, so many tools at our disposal yeah. to, to sort of understand the earth. Um, I think, you know, like a lot of people, and I'm probably not saying anything too new that we, we lack the political will um, and we lack the kind of policy innovations and we lack the urgency. Um, I'm heartened when I look at the younger generation of my kids, when I see someone like Greta Thun- Thunberg um, sort of galvanizing opinion around, around this urgent issue. Um, it gives me hope. So um, that's not, I mean, I think in many ways, science has done more than its part, but it can't carry this weight all the way. And, um, you know, we, we have, uh, we have um, a, a, an abundance of riches in terms of what the last few decades have provided us with, um, both in terms of satellite observations, field observations, um, climate models. We know so much already um, more than I think if you went back in time and told people in the 1970s what we would know by the year 2020, it would be just astounding. Um, but of course, the difference is, is action and urgency. So um, when I think of science's role, I, I don't think of it as doing anything different. I mean, there's a lot of 
conversation and debate over how involved science scientists right. should be in politics and policy. Um, I kind of sit that one out. I know that's a personal decision for a lot of scientists, and I'm I'm not a scientist by training. I'm just a journalist and a writer, and I can make my points in a way that that some people expect journalists or sci- or, or writers to do without sort of you know jeoparding my. Um, my tenure or anything like that. So, um, you know, that's a, that I think is a personal decision, but, but I, I, um, I feel like sometimes, and maybe this answers the question, puts a, puts a cap on it, that um, we're letting the scientists down, <laughs> that they worked yeah. so hard and for so many years and for, with such kind of like heroic resolve and they've given us data, insight, um, knowledge, wisdom to some extent, and now it's time for everybody else to act on it. Okay, well, and then, you know, sort of on, on that note, first of all, you are a scientist. <laughs> I think we all, I mean, humans are, uh, mm-hmm. you know, just the way the journalists, my daughter was a journalist, um, uh-huh. you, know, go, you know, go about their business. You ask questions, you test your assumptions, you discover we're all a little bit scientists. But I really like your phrase, science has done its part, but it cannot carry us all the way. And so thank you. And... Uh, my conclusion is go out and vote. Yes. So, that's going to carry us all the way. And wear a mask. Thanks very much for a terrific <laughs> Okay. Evening. Great, Peter. Thank you so much. Yeah.